Coming up on Avant Technology Insights with Ken Presti. The typical approach is going to be back up everything and replicate some things. Back up in disaster recovery is the Rodney danger field of technology. It gets no respect. At least not until something bad happens and then suddenly the continuation of your business often hinges upon it. We'll talk about building a solid plan for backup in DR, DR as a service, the role of the cloud and the cloud provider, best practices for testing your system, how to do all this effectively, and a little something called the 3 two, one rule. Welcome to Avant Technology Insights. I'm your host, Ken Presti, Research Vice President of Avant Research and Analytics. The link between solving business challenges and cutting-edge technologies has become tighter and more complex than ever before. In this podcast series from Avant Research and Analytics, we help enterprise decision makers sort through the business case, the value, the challenges, and ultimately the bottom line of technology adoption. So listen to us at your desktop, take us in the car, tune in from the commuter train, or download us at the gate. You'll find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google, as well as at www.goavant.net slash podcast. My guest today graduated summa cum laude from Northwestern University with a degree in electrical engineering. He's an expert in cloud, connectivity, UCAS, SD-WAN, security, and a host of other Avant-aligned technologies, including replication, backup, and disaster recovery. Born and raised in the wave of cloud technology, he's the Director of Engineering at Avant Communications. My good friend, Nico O'Hara, is with us today. Nico, thank you very much for joining us today. We're going to be looking at backup and DR. This is going to be the first time we talked about backup and DR on this podcast, so you're you're paving some new ground for us today, my friend. I appreciate that. Um, let's start with a fairly basic point. I tend to think of you know backup and DR as this unified kind of thing, as a, as a singular thing, but it's actually two different technologies. It's not really like peanut butter and jelly at all, because you know it is they are separate things, and we're used to thinking of them in kind of a, in kind of jointly, but it's actually two different things that you need to look at separately in terms of putting that overall solution together. How would would you define those differences between backup and DR and how that would necessitate a different approach for each one? Yeah, and I mean, that's a great point that you made, Ken. So backup is really all about protecting your data, you know, whether it's for legal reasons or compliance reasons or, or just because you can't afford to lose any kind of data, you know, even from seven years ago. Uh, that's what backup is for. So whether it's just checking the box, whether it's making sure that some data didn't get compromised, if you need to recover from a ransomware attack, you're going to roll back to a backup from a week or a month ago or however far back you need to go in order to make sure that data uh, integrity was not compromised. When we talk about disaster recovery, we're really talking about not just recovering data, but also recovering applications and essentially getting the IT portion of the business back up and running. And I used the word backup, and so I apologize for that. But in any case, we want to get the business up and running. And that means we could be recovering from backup, but that might take a really long time. We could be replicating systems in near real time and recovering those in a couple hours. So once we get into disaster recovery, it starts to become all about how critical is a certain system or application to the business? How quickly do we need to recover it? How much data can we lose? So backup strategy can certainly be part of your overall DR strategy, but it's generally not the whole thing. Interesting point about the applications, about you know being able to replicate what's going on there. How is that different these days in the cloud world as opposed to what it was like back in the data center days? Sure. So uh, there's a there's a different answer there for backup and then for kind of replication. But I'll give you the replication answer to start. So. Um, if you were to do it yourself, right, and, and build a, a DR site on your own, uh, whether you're doing that at your own you know, corporate location, your own purpose-built data center, or your own, uh, you know, maybe you're doing a, a co-location facility and you're putting your own equipment in there, that can be really costly because to do, to do true DR, you want to have a like-for-like system. So whatever you've got built on the production side, you want to replicate that completely on the DR side. And the problem is you're essentially talking about making 
a duplicate investment in something that you hope you'll never use. Uh, it's really an insurance system. So when you do fully, you know, one-to-one, like for like, it's really hard to justify that cost to the business. So most companies don't do that. So what they'll end up with is maybe, you know, 50% of their infrastructure uh, sitting at a second site. And that site is, you know, they're replicating data to it, but they're probably not testing it very frequently. And a test might even be disruptive to the production environment. So they might actually have to go in and test that on the weekend. And we don't probably know many uh, IT folks or just folks in general who want to go do something like that on their Saturday night. And so what happens is those systems don't get tested and they're often, you know, lacking in the first place to even recover a full environment. So when that happens, and when you're not testing it, and when it's not sufficient to recover your environment, that becomes a huge problem when you actually have some kind of DR event, you try to fail over and things don't work properly. Um, and, and it's not as simple as just pushing a button and having everything work. There's so many components to it. There's the networking requirements. There's making sure that servers boot in the right order um, to get applications up and running. So that is really painful to do on your own um, and can be really expensive. And the days of kind of doing 100% like for like or going with you know legacy companies that have had that approach where they've built your entire environment in a dedicated setup, those are gone too because cloud makes that a lot more cost effective and really efficient. So what we see in a cloud model is kind of that as a service approach where you consume what you need, right? So what we'll often see is you tier out your applications and maybe not every single one needs to be replicated. So you replicate the most critical applications and you do something like backup for maybe those less critical applications. You tie that all into one unified strategy. And then you really only pay for the resources that you need when you need them. So you leverage a cloud provider to offer that replication software. Maybe they're monitoring it and providing testing for you so you know that it will always work. And then maybe you're only paying for storage because you always consume that. But you might not be paying for those compute resources. So the CPU and the RAM, if you don't use those on a monthly basis, why would you pay for them? Um, in a cloud model, you can get away with that because the provider is essentially you know, giving you access to this multi-tenant environment and they don't, they're sharing those resources. So they don't dedicate it to you. You don't have to pay for it. In that legacy model, you had to go out and buy it. Whether you use it or not, you're paying for it. So let's go back to the scary thing you said a moment ago. You said this can be expensive and I can <laughs> see everybody you know, getting a little bit jumpy as soon as they hear that. Now, here's the thing. Um, not only is it expensive, but you may never have to use it. You hope you won't, um, but it is, it is insurance in essence. What do you hear from the trusted advisors in terms of the degree of pushback that they're getting uh, from their own, uh, from their, from their customers and their management teams about, gee, do we really need to spend this kind of money on something when nothing has really happened? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. We should do it, but Hey, this has never happened before. So how do you justify this expense? Yeah. So that's actually a really great point. And that is probably the number one pushback that we get uh, when we're talking to clients about you know, really DRAS solutions and what we try you know, the arguments we try to make and that our providers try to make are <laughs> successful to varying degrees. But what we find is that backup is often a good foot in the door. You know, everyone to some degree is doing backup already. And if you're backing up, you know, to tape, which is not necessarily reliable, um, or you're not even backing up off site, then that can be a quick foot in the door that's pretty cost effective. Um, and, and really all we're doing is we're saying you're backing up here, just point those backups to some cheap offsite storage. And now we have the backup somewhere else. If your entire site were to go down for some reason, your data still lives somewhere else. You can recover it. Um, and that can often be a good way to then expand into DRAS where you say, look, we've got all your systems backed up, but these five virtual machines, wouldn't you want to recover those a little bit faster? You know, this might take two days. What about four hours, eight hours, or 24 hours? Do you need to get any systems back up and running in that time? And as we kind of start to talk through that, then we realize that, hey, maybe we want to replicate those couple systems. We don't need to replicate everything. And I think that's where a lot of deals fall apart is when you look at a client's environment and you say, all right, you've got 70 VMs and 30 terabytes of storage, and we're going to replicate everything using a you know near real-time replication tool that could be really expensive. And suddenly you've got a massive bill as a customer and you say, all right, well, we DRAS isn't for us. Cloud doesn't mm -hmm. work for us. So you've really, I think you've got to be flexible. 
also, if the client does have, you know, some specific driver that's happened recently, you know, if it was a cybersecurity attack or some downtime that they had, or maybe, uh, you know, they're decommissioning a site. And so they're, they're not even going to have their own DR site anymore. That can really help. Um, but to your point, you know, there's, you've got to be flexible and you've got to be kind of nimble um, with how you approach it and how you present it to the customer. So you're not just doing the same thing that they would have done on their own and doing completely like for like, you know, duplicating costs. So let's say I'm a customer and I am extremely price sensitive and you're going to do this incremental approach with me. What are some of, what are some of the things that you're going to recommend that I back up right away? And I mean, some of them are probably pretty obvious, but what are the ones that are also more likely to slip through the cracks that really do need to be replicated? Otherwise, you get to the other end of a situation. It's like, oh my God, I've got all this other stuff, but the, here's you know some of the real fun fundamental enabling data that that I really didn't back up and I'm really sorry I did that. What are the cautionary tales there? Yeah, so uh, what we would advise and you know not every customer is going to do this, but the typical approach is going to be back up everything and replicate replicate some things. So what we mean by that is, you know, you want to protect all of your data. You don't want to risk losing data. Um, and replication is great for bringing systems online, but replication is not a substitute for, you know, recovering data that somebody deleted three weeks ago. That's, that's really not what it's for because with backup, you're going to throw it on, um, you know, cheap storage that isn't built for, for, built for performance. It's just built to retain data for long periods of time. And you're going to compress it. You're going to try to make as small of a footprint as possible and just keep costs down. So then with replication, like you were just describing, we're going to put that on pretty decent storage, right? We want to be able to actually recover workloads on that storage in as little time as possible. So essentially, it's going to look like a mirror of whatever you had on your production side. Um, and, and what those systems tend to be, they're often going to be, you know, your active directory, you need a way to authenticate users to the systems that they need access to. You know, if there's any key networking requirements you're or, or network systems, you've got to make sure those are up and running very quickly too. And then you might have, you know, maybe there's some critical databases uh, that, that power different applications in your business. You know, maybe it's e-commerce um, or maybe it's, uh, you know, an ERP or a CRM because you're, you're a customer facing business, your, your voice systems, your PBX tends to be pretty critical as well. Um, and then, you know, even things like email, it, it may not be, it may not seem that, you know, that critical or that mission critical that you need to get it up and running, you know, in five minutes. But if your business runs on a lot of interactions between customers or other companies and email is one of the primary ways you do that, you can't necessarily wait 24 hours to, that, to come back online. You know, I know uh, last week, when Microsoft had an outage with Teams and Exchange briefly and within Avant, you know, I was trying to get work done and I couldn't and I restarted my computer and I still couldn't. And I sat there like, well, you know, might as well take the day off. There's nothing I can right. do now. So <laughs> it's those communication systems and then those sort of those key business applications that help you to drive revenue. Yeah. So I've heard you and our other colleagues in the engineering department use a term called the three, two, one rule. So my question to you is, say what? <laughs> yeah. So, so the three, two, one rule is, uh, it's easy to remember because the numbers <laughs> go down in decreasing order. Um, but what it really means is it's a backup oriented rule. And so it's supported by many different backup software providers out in the industry. Uh, and then many of our service providers will We'll point to it as well and say, Mr. Client, you know, this is kind of the bare minimum that you ever want to do for backing up your data. If you want to make sure that you're not losing data on a, you know, in case something happens, you want to follow this rule. And really what it means is you want the three is three copies of your data. So that counts the production copy, right? So if you're running, I don't know, Microsoft Exchange and you have all your email data, that server, that email server, that's one copy. But you want to have two more copies of the data somewhere. Then the two is we want to have at least two different media types. So if we're running it on, you know, production storage on a, a server that's running on a SAN or a SSD or some local type of storage, we want to have at least one other type of storage. So if that's disk, we want to have maybe tape or we want to have, um, you know, some kind of cloud storage, something that's not exactly the same because, you know, tape, for example, is known to fail. You don't want to have all your copies of your data on tape. You want a little diversity there. 
And then lastly, the one means one copy should reside off-site. So if you've got a bunch of copies of your data on a bunch of different media types and they're all at the same office and that office burns down, then you're screwed. So you at least want to have one um, that you're replicating to your, or, you know, backing up to your other site or your other data center. A lot of times it's literally someone uh, in IT backing up to tape and then taking the tapes home with them and storing them in the garage or the basement. And that's, that's absolutely atrocious, but Hey, at least they're following the rule, right? They're trying. Um, so Often what will, when we come into one of those opportunities, the, the portion of that deal that we fulfill is that one offsite that typically becomes the cloud portion. So if I've got a company that's maybe a couple hundred seats or less, can I just, is this kind of like a big boy project or is this the kind of thing that I don't need to worry about if I'm running a smaller company or, or I have to worry about less of it? You know, that's, that's a good question. I think when you're a smaller business, um, you tend to have, you know, just from budgeting constraints or whatever the case may be, you probably don't have as solid of a strategy as those mid to large enterprises do, right? You may not even be following the three, two, one rule today, but the nice thing about our portfolio of service providers and all these backup and disaster recovery options within that portfolio is that we can enable that functionality and help you to, to meet that requirement at fairly low cost. When we're talking specifically backup to um, you know, it can be really cheap. You know, we're talking pennies to the gigabyte, um, which is, you know, dollars to the terabyte. Um, you know, maybe it's a hundred dollars or so per terabyte per month, but that's mm-hmm. still pretty cheap versus, you know, going out and building your own system when you can just kind of point and click, use the backup software that you already have and call it a day. You know, you just kind of set it and forget it. Um, I know that's that's a term that's overused, but it really is that simple. Depending on the backup software that you have, you know, you go in, you say point to this provider, you say copy my existing policies, let's keep it for this long, and I'm done. And I never have to touch it again unless something bad happens. So let's say that, you know, in my company, I really haven't done a good job of mapping out, you know, backup and disaster and replication and all this stuff. And I'm starting from a relatively greenfield kind of environment from a backup and disaster recovery point of view. Mm -hmm. What are the key considerations that I need to keep in mind when I'm shopping for a system um, and I've got a lot of people coming to me saying, you know, go with my system, no, go with mine. Uh, What should I be? using as some of those evaluative criteria? So that's a combination of things. And and some of that we help with, you know, very specifically. And some of that, you know, we try to work with whatever the client wants to do um, versus, you know, advising them maybe specifically. But part of that goes into what are the systems you're trying to protect? Do you have virtual machines? You know, everything's built on VMware. That's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You can back that up. You can replicate it. Um, all the cloud providers are going to work with that really easily. On the other hand, if you say, look, we've kind of fallen behind, we've got a lot of legacy physical servers. Um, Hey, they're running Windows, but maybe it's outdated versions of Windows. We've got a little Linux in there. That becomes a lot more complicated. We've got to find a solution that can handle those physical and virtual workloads. And then if (laughs) if you're maybe a larger enterprise uh, and you've got really legacy systems running business critical applications and you just haven't been able to update that code for whatever reason, because you don't want to break it. Then we're looking at, you know, you've got HP UX or Unix or uh, IBM systems that nobody really wants to touch. Um, So then you've got to go with a really expensive enterprise grade backup solution um, and or replication solution. But you're looking at the likes of, you know, Commvault or Veritas Net Backup or EMC, Dell EMC products. And those can get really expensive really quickly. So the simpler your requirements are, based on the systems we're trying to protect, the easier it is from both a cost perspective and then sort of a plugging into the cloud and playing easily perspective. Um, So it kind of comes down to what are you protecting? And then let's talk about, you know, is this backup? Is this backup in DR? Do you want this managed or not? Um, You know, do you want, do you need local backups? Sorry. Do you need local backups in addition to cloud? We start to get into those components of it, but first we just need to know what are we protecting? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you need to do basically is to do a complete inventory of the types of systems and what those systems are running on. 
Yeah, and it's yeah. it's sometimes it's really hard <laughs> for us to get that information, and you <laughs> it's very frustrating. Um, but at the they very don't often like, know because sometimes right. they don't know. I mean, sometimes they don't know, or sometimes they can just kind of give you a a very high level. But if you want specifics, they'll say, "Well, we don't have that," you know, or we'd have to go run a tool to do that. So we'll work with whatever we're given, right? But at the very least, we we want to understand, you know, give me the size and scope of the environment. Let me know the types of systems we're running, you know, physical or virtual. And then dialing one level deeper into that, okay, if they're physical, well, what operating systems are we talking about? Um, and that's, we'll work with, you know, whatever they can give us and we'll try to be as accurate as possible. But if they are ever able to produce, like you said, that inventory or run something like RV tools in a VMware environment that really quickly gives you, you know, a full list of components in that environment and with, the, you know, the resources they're consuming, then that's great. And then we can be extremely accurate. And then that also helps with producing quotes. Um, but if not, we'll get them at least to the service providers and the solutions that can match up to what they've got. So let's say we've got the system up and running. It's been up and running for a while. How often should I test? And what are the things that I'm going to be looking for within that test? So kind of along the lines of, you know, what are the more common issues that you run across when these systems fail? You know, and these are things that I'm probably going to want to keep in mind, especially if I'm giving up Saturday morning cartoons to come <laughs> into the office and, and run this test. Right. So the there's a couple a couple components to this answer but one um you know you want to test at the very least once a year and that's that's kind of the bare minimum um a lot of our service providers when you go with uh, one of them and you contract for DRAS they're going to give you at least one test typically what i see is two tests per year that are included in that monthly cost and what that means is you can call them up you can, you know, sort of declare if, as you would a real disaster, but you'll tell them this is a test. Then they'll start bringing up systems on their side and you can kind of walk through the whole process. You, you'll work with them to build a run book, which basically says, you know, I need these servers to boot in this order. I need this to happen. We need to make these networking changes. You know, I need you to call so-and-so or so-and-so will call you. Um, and you kind of go through that whole thing. And then, um, you know, you could maybe be testing even more frequently than that. Some providers will let you do it and they'll essentially just charge you for the resources that you use when you do that. But I think for the most part, just kind of painting with a broad brush, we're going to see clients go with the number of tests they're given, you know, at no charge. They're, they're typically not wanting to pay more than that. Um, so maybe two times a year. And then the issues that they might face, you know, a lot of times it's not necessarily that the data isn't getting replicated or, you know, that we're not able to bring the server up on the provider side. You know, those are actually both fairly straightforward things to do. But some of the things you might be looking for are, hey, whoops, we uh, we upgraded these systems on our end and we didn't let you know that. And so you're, you know, the server that we're replicating to isn't the right version, you know, or, or it's the wrong operating system. Um, or, hey, we added, you know, these 12 virtual machines over the last six months and we didn't replicate those. Um, so that's going to be a problem because some of our other applications are, are codependent on those. Um, and then the networking component is another big one. And that's, you know, you really want to figure out your subnets and basically all the IP addressing so that when the system does go down on the production side, everyone can access it, right? Because if you bring everything up on the other side, hey, we've got it all up in an hour and no one can get to it. Well, then you really failed. Um, mm -hmm. And actually yeah. you didn't do anything right. And the provider is going to say, look, we did our bit. You know, that's on you um, and they can help you with it. But really, at the end of the day, that's your responsibility as a client. So I think the last part that I'll echo there is when you build those run books with a provider and you kind of draw that line of delineation, you want to know the roles and responsibilities. You want to know exactly what you're responsible for as a customer and what they're responsible for as a service provider. And if you've had the same system up and running for, you know, a lengthy period of time, how do you know as an enterprise IT planner when it's time to start looking at a new updated system? Because, you know, aside from the the annual tests or the biannual tests, however you do it, this is one of those things that kind of runs in the background and you may not even want to look at it all that much. But at some point, you know, uh, technology marches on and you're probably going to have to look at, at, a, um, at an upgrade at some point. How do you know when it's time to upgrade and, and what, what's that action item look like? So there's going to be a lot of varying answers there, but it, it also just depends on, you know, how risk averse that business is, right? Because there's some, some businesses that are going to be really strict about it and they'll say, look, when a server or a, 
you know, a storage system, whatever it is, reaches three years or reaches five years in life, we're going to pretty aggressively start replacing that stuff. We don't want to let it run for longer than, you know, what it might be recommended to do. And, and when it starts getting out of date compared to the newer technology, but others are going to run that thing for as long as it works. You know, and if that ends up being seven years, if that ends up being nine years, they're going to keep running it uh, until it dies. So those ones, it's, it can be harder. Um, to convince them, you know, that they really need to change anything. So what what we'll see in those cases usually is that, hey, everything's fine. Well, at least let's get some DR in place. Um, and then God forbid anything actually does happen, you can fail it over. And then let's talk about maybe you need to upgrade it or, hey, maybe you need to move it into the cloud and just avoid that hardware upgrade altogether and not have to worry about maintaining it, scaling it, all of those components that you normally do on-prem. And I think this might be a good place to plug the fact that when you talk about DR, DR is probably the greatest, um, you know, I guess I'm looking for a way to say this, but the greatest foot in the door to get into public cloud or private cloud for production infrastructure. So IaaS, because once you've already protected your systems and then, you know, whatever it is, you're doing a test or you have an outage and you fail over to the cloud, you might look at it and say, hey, we're, we're already running in the cloud. Everything works. Do I really want to go out and buy all the new hardware that I need to for whatever outage we just suffered and try to replace everything and then fill back and do this all over again. Or maybe I just stay with what I've got. It's running. It works. Let's just add DR to the systems that I've already got running. And now we've got IaaS in the cloud and then DR to a different location with the same cloud provider. And hey, everything's already pre-programmed, right? I've got the networking worked out. You know, the whole thing is working exactly the way I want it to. Let's not mess with a good thing. So to your point, that can often be kind of the triggering event too, is, hey, there's a DR event we failed over. And now maybe let's just think about running this in a you know permanent fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I can see the value of doing that complete inventory, not just from the perspective of the trusted advisor, but also from the perspective of the enterprise decision maker, who's going to be looking at, you know, now I've got my hands completely around my, uh, my IT infrastructure and how I'm running it. Um, so I can better evaluate things moving forward. So Nico, this has been a, a great half hour spent with you today. I really appreciate it. Um, this whole whole, you know, DR thing and uh, backup and DR is kind of the Rodney danger field of the, the tech industry in a lot of ways that, you know, it's not the kind of thing that people really like to talk about, but it's one of those things that they really need, or at least they, it's not that they don't want to talk about it as much that they're distracted by other things that are of higher profile, but this is the kind of thing that's also important to take a strong look at and have ready because when you need it, um, it will already be too late to make any decisions. So Nico O'Hara, Director of, of Engineering at Avant Communications, thank you so much for being our guest today. We'll look forward to talking to you again soon, my friend. All right, Ken. Thank you. You've been listening to Avant Technology Insights, featuring information and opinions on how key technologies can be leveraged to solve business problems. Avant Technology Insights is a service of Avant Communications, a platform for IT decision making. All opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the guests and the host. For more information, please feel free to download our research reports and other resources at www.goavant.net. That's www.goav as in victory, ant.net. For Avant Research and Analytics, this is Ken Presti.